Welcome to another episode of Growth Hacker TV. I'm Bronson Taylor, and today I have Guy Kawasaki with us. Guy, thank you so much for coming on the program. Sure, sure. It's bright and early in California, ready to roll. That's right. It's around lunchtime here, so I've been up for a little bit. Um, now, Guy, you don't actually need an introduction, but I'll give a quick one just in <laughs> case people don't know who you are. Uh, you actually helped market the Apple Macintosh back in 1984 as the first official Apple evangelist. And since then, you've had an incredible career as an entrepreneur, an investor, an advisor, a writer, a speaker. The list goes on and on and on. Uh, you've done a few things. Yes. And I know you have a, a new book out called Ape, um, author, publisher, entrepreneur. Um, and it's an awesome book. I read that. But I actually want to talk about one of your previous books just because of our audience. I want to talk about the book Reality Check. And I'll hold it up here so people okay. can get a good look at it for the ones watching the video. Um, the best way to describe Reality Check is it's kind of like the Bible for startups. I mean, you give entrepreneurs you know, advice on everything from venture capital to the art of leadership and everything in between. But you have a lot in there about marketing and distribution and how to grow a product. So I want to dive into some of those things. Sound good okay. to you? Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, let me correct something you said. I, I am not or was not the first evangelist. The first evangelist was a guy named Mike Boych. So I'm actually the second evangelist. Ah, okay. Maybe Wikipedia has me uh, saying the wrong thing there. I'm not sure. <laughs> I'll go fix it. Okay. Yeah, there you go. Well, you're, you're the most well-known evangelist. I can say that. Uh, well, there was Jesus before me, but yeah. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> now, in, this, uh, in the book Reality Check, you have a list in there called Stupid Ways to Hinder Market Adoption. And everybody yeah. watching this wants market adoption, so let's not do the stupid things. Um, yeah. You say one of the stupid things that people do is to have enforced immediate registration. Uh, why is that a mistake? Well, because at, at the beginning, you know, first of all, you're lucky that a company has discovered you at all, right? Mm -hmm. And so, first of all, now you're, you're that far. And then what do you do? You put a fence in front of them as soon as, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, this would be like, so you start a restaurant and um, finally you get people to come to your restaurant and the first thing they encounter is, well, you have to uh, have a reservation. And then you look in the restaurant and there's nobody sitting anywhere. You say, no, nope, but you need a reservation. It's like, why don't you just tell people we don't want you to eat here? Yeah. So you, you need to lower all the barriers and you know suck people in and when people start um, loving what you do, then you can ask for a registration. Then you can even ask for payment. Yeah. Uh, don't do it up front. I mean, why make it harder on yourself? Yeah, so it's really about timing. You need the data. You need them to register at some point. It just doesn't need to be the first step. Wait till they love what you're doing, and then you'll get everything you need. Yeah. Uh, well, what, what, you know, one good test is would you like to have to register as the first step for this restaurant or for this website? And probably not. Mm -hmm. So why are you asking people to do something you wouldn't do? Yeah, that's very true. Um, the next one is really good. It's, it's obvious, but it's good. It's You say there's a lack of ways to share an experience. Walk me through that. Well, if you if you have this great experience, this great computer, this great phone, this great website, you should make it as easy as possible to share this, to share a blog post, to share a YouTube video. Uh, you know, all these places now built in a way where you click on one button and you tweet it. You click on another button and it's Google Plus and you, you click on this other button and it's Facebook. Oh, that's an example. You shouldn't make people say, wow, I really like this blog post. So what I'll do is I'll, I'll go up here, I'll select the link, I'll copy it, I'll open up my email client, I'll find the people in my address book who might like it, I'll paste it in and send it. I mean... <laughs> Not happening. Yes. <laughs> yeah, not happening. Not happening. Yeah. No, that's absolutely true. You know, on Growth Hacker TV, I've buried share buttons all over the place. And at some point, I felt kind of ridiculous. Like, all right, do I really need a share button here? And then, oddly enough, I'm watching Twitter, and there they are, people using them day in and day out. And yeah. people will share things if you give them the opportunity. But like you said, you know, the hard part is getting the experience they want to share. Don't <laughs> let the hard part be sharing it, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, yeah, just yesterday... I discovered this new website called Click to Tweet. And <laughs> what this one. does is it, it, it creates a little snippet of code that embeds into your documents and it literally says, you know, click to tweet. And, and the way I discovered this is someone who does work with me, she put it in an email newsletter that I publish. Mm -hmm. And it was click to tweet, 
to tell people about this free offer for Ape. We're giving Ape away right now. Wow. And so I was on Twitter and I saw like dozens of this identical <laughs> tweets saying, you know, have you gotten guys free book? Have you gotten guys free book? Have you gotten? I was like 60 of those. I'm like, how the hell do 60 people tweet that all of a sudden? It was because it was in a newsletter and all they had to do was click to tweet. What yeah. a concept. Yeah. What a concept. You know what's at the top of my to do list right now? I kid you not is yeah. add click to tweet to all of our emails that go out from Growth Hacker TV because we send out new emails about, hey, new episode. So you know what yeah. I'm going to try to do? I'm going to send your episode out today if it all goes well. I'm going to okay. add a click to tweet in the email for the first time in your episode that goes out, and we'll see okay. what happens. <laughs> I, I bet you you will be stunned Yeah, because I was just blown away. I think that you know if you count the tweets and the retweets, okay, so this is – you know, this is uh, this is what I call agency math. So when you have an agency, this is the kind of bullshit math they do. All right. So <laughs> let's say let's say they count. I don't know, a hundred tweets. So they say a hundred tweets, and on average, people have maybe a thousand they thousand followers. So they take a hundred and they multiply by a thousand. You and they get a reach now. Out. Yeah, and they say, "Wow, well, I got a reach of a hundred thousand." Like, Okay, yeah, so, you know, and point oh 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 one percent of that is going to buy the book, but, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Agency math is not real math. <laughs> yeah. Well, on the other hand, you know, what the hell, right? Yeah, you know, you're putting it out there. There's a chance. I mean, it's, it's not bad to try. It's not like it costs you anything. The marginal, yeah. you know, cost is nothing, so. Well, even point oh 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 one percent is better than zero percent. So. That's true. That's true. <laughs> uh, you know, the next thing you say is having a lack of feeds and email list is one of those stupid ways to hinder market adoption. Uh, talk yeah. me through that. It seems kind of similar to the last one. Yeah, well, uh, you know, it's one thing people want to share a blog post or share a video, but that's after they've read it or after they found it. So the question is, how do they find out about it? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to this day, I think email lists are probably the most powerful way yeah. that, uh, you know, e even on on all these social media networks, I mean, stuff is just flying by, right? And like, let's say that you know your part of the audience is Pacific time, but even if you're, even if you knew everybody, if you knew all your readers lived in California, that doesn't mean they all have the same habit. That doesn't mean they all read at seven or eight or nine, or they read at lunchtime, or they read at four o'clock towards the end of the day, or they read at seven o'clock when they get home. So. You know, the stuff is just flying past. They're not going to scroll back through a thousand tweets to nope. find the tweet you made eight hours ago. So, I mean, that actually leads to two things. I repeat the tweets. Mm -hmm. So that's one that, you know, not everybody agrees with. But the other is if they're on an email newsletter, they, they probably, they may get 200 emails a day, but 200 emails is still less than, you know, the thousands of tweets and the thousands of Facebook posts and the thousands yeah. of other things that you're competing with. So email is quite effective to this day. Yeah. The signal to noise ratio on email is still better than the signal to noise <laughs> ratio on any social network. <laughs> Scary to say that, but yes, that's true. Yeah. I mean, it may not be someday, but today it is. So, you know, we have to go with the channel that gets people's attention still. Now, at the end of this list, you say, uh, quote, adoption is in the details. And I love that because I've built a lot of products and I feel that deep in my bones. But tell me what you mean by that, that adoption is in the details. I mean that, you know, people love to talk about these big visions and these big trends and all that. But at the very end, I think a lot of adoption is based on your product or your service doing, you know, one thing or a few things really, really well. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, an example that I use, I use Buffer to post many of my social media things. And it's because I could send it to Buffer and Buffer will put it out on schedule, spread it out during the day. It'll include the picture. Uh, it'll include the picture properly, you know, all this kind of stuff. And if, if you don't know much about social media and you just listen to what I said, you might not understand what I just said. But if you do understand social media, what I just said is very powerful. Uh -huh. So it's it's this kind of detail thing that um, once you get into something, I mean, it, in a sense, it's like any other. Uh, maybe a good example is um, cooking. So, you know, there are people who are really great cooks, 
and they they have like this one knife to do one specific thing, right? Or they have this one tool to just I don't know, just grind macadamia nuts, <laughs> and 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 they tell people, oh yeah, you know, if you really need to grind macadamia nuts, this is the best tool in the world to do it. Mm -hmm. Not everybody needs to grind a macadamia nut, but if you do, I mean, that's the tool, right? I mean, yeah. that's what it takes. No, it's a good example. We actually just bought some new knives, and we have a dedicated tomato knife. And so now, oh. every time I'm going to cut a tomato, I grab that one. They told me it's the best tool. It is the best tool. I use it, and I'm happy with it. So that's, well, that's the way it goes. Yesterday, believe it or not, I was having an email conversation with people from Blendtec, and they told me <laughs> they make a new kind of... Um, not not the base blender, but the the glass cup thing, mm -hmm. and, it, and it's made specifically to make butters, butters, okay, like butter, peanut butter, you know, I guess walnut butter, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So specific mm -hmm. for that. There's something on the on the inside that pushes. I guess butter is really sticky, so it has this special thing that pushes things back into the middle, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a very specific use mm -hmm. for one kind of blend tech. I don't know what they call that thing. You know, that yeah, butter maker. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But if that's what you need, you're not going to go buy some general purpose one and try to make it do it. Yeah. No, that's yep. good. Now, you also have a chapter in the book on selling. Um, and I think some of the insights here are just incredible. Um, the first one may, might be my favorite thing we're going to talk about today, which is see the gorilla. So tell yeah. me, what was the gorilla experiment, and what do you mean when you say see the gorilla? Okay, so there was this experiment where a professor at the University, I think, of Illinois, uh, he did a thing where he told people, he told experimental subjects to watch a video and in this video, there were people tossing balls, black balls and white balls, to each other. And so the task was something like count how many times they threw the black ball or count how many times they threw the white ball, whatever it was. And in the middle of this video, a guy in a gorilla suit comes out, walks around, you know, does stuff, and then leaves. So after the, the video is ended, there was a question like, did you see anything unusual in this? <laughs> and apparently only 50% of the people said, yeah, somebody came out in a gorilla suit and started, you know, dancing around. <laughs> so half the people didn't see the gorilla. And it was obvious. And it was very obvious. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, we say it's very obvious, but, you know, we could be in that 50%, yeah, right? That's true. So the message there is that sometimes... Uh, you're in the middle of something and you don't see the gorilla. So the example in, in real world businesses with Apple, uh, we were trying to make Macintosh a spreadsheet database and word processing machine. But in the middle of this, people started embracing desktop publishing. Mm -hmm. So desktop publishing was the gorilla. That's what saved Macintosh. It was a market you didn't see. Yeah, because we couldn't, but we couldn't see it because we were so set on spreadsheet database and word mm. process. So the spreadsheet database word process was the equivalent of watching the people throw the black and the white balls. <laughs> Meanwhile, there was a gorilla called desktop publishing. Took us a while to figure that out. Yeah. So the startups watching this, they need to really understand there's entire markets that are waiting to throw money at you that you yeah. literally do not see even though they're standing right in front of you and you have to change your frame of mind do something <laughs> jar yourself to see what only half the people really see right right that's yeah. the message no that's great um, and the next thing you say is also a really good uh, insight from Apple I think sell don't enable buying uh, most people just enable buying hey there's something yes. for sale you can get it if you want but what is Apple doing what do great companies do well, sell means, you know, you get pushy, you get promotional, you, you take it to them. Mm -hmm. uh, some people might find that distasteful, but those are the poor people. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you have to do it. I mean, as great as iPhone, iPod, iPad, Macintosh was, I mean, you need to push it down people's throats. Yeah. Uh, and and the very earliest, you know, sort of the, the most cogent representation of this today is probably social media. That, you know, a lot of brands, they just, they don't use social media well at all. They're like mm -hmm. total wimps. Um, if you look at most brands, if you look at the Facebook page of most brands, they post once a day. Okay? And that just freaking boggles my mind. Mm -hmm. And I, and it's, it's either stupidity 
or arrogance. So let me explain the stupidity part. Okay. You'd have to be pretty stupid to assume that anybody who's interested in your product is going to see one post a day. <laughs> I mean, that's like saying we're going to advertise a new computer on TV, but we're going to add, we're going to run that ad at 8 a.m. <laughs> that's it, 8 a.m. Because people are going to be so interested that they're going to see it, right? Mm -hmm. That is just it's stupid. The arrogance part of it is I think some people believe that our posts, our page, our social media presence is so freaking awesome that eight hours after we post, people are going to scroll back in the timeline and find out what we post. Right? Mm -hmm. So this is like saying our advertising for our product is so awesome that people are going to TiVo advertising. So we're going to run the ad at 8 a.m. People are going to come home at 8 p.m. and they're going to say, oh, what happened 12 hours ago on TV? Let's just go back on TiVo and find that ad. Mm -hmm. And I like, what drug are you smoking? So so what I'm saying is, man, push. You got to, if you push four or five times a day, Hey, I mean, if people watch ESPN or CNN, they're running the identical video mm -hmm. 10 times a day. That's not because they're stupid. Yeah. It's because some people watch TV at different times. Now, all the agencies, this is getting back to agency logic. Mm -hmm. Every agency will tell you they, quote, know that the optimal number of posts per day is one. <laughs> and you ask, well, how do you know this? And they say, well, we just know. Mm -hmm. that's, I guess that's how agencies do things. They just freaking know, right? So, I mean, you know, if, if they had said, okay, so we tried. We tried four a day and we got, well, I was talking to an agency and they told me, well, post once per day, we get X shares, we get X comments, we get X plus ones, right? If we post four times a day, none of those posts have the equivalent of that one post. Okay, mm -hmm. so it's let's, let's for ease of use. Let's say if you you post once, you get X shares of legs or whatever. Mm -hmm. if you post four times, you get one fourth X per thing. Let's mm -hmm. just say. But I hear that I say, well, you know, isn't the most important thing the number of comments and likes and shares? So even if one has more mm -hmm. than four, but if the four added up equals more than the one. You should post more. Absolutely. I mean, I mean, I, I'm not a math major. Yeah. But well, you know, you... I, I finally seen the light with this because I started looking at the Twitter accounts that have a ton of followers being added every day. You know, the yeah. Kiss Metrics blog, for yeah. an example. They put out so many tweets every hour, and people yeah. just love them. So I started putting out tweets all day long from our account. I start sending emails now as much as I possibly can. I'm pushing. I'm selling. I'm not just <laughs> hoping somebody shows up and buys. You know, well, and it's working. Nobody's mad. <laughs> but but you know you know what else brands and agencies will tell you? They'll say, well, when we did this, we got a lot of feedback. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, well, what is quote a lot of feedback? We said, oh, we got like five or ten negative comments. I'm going to unfollow you. You're spamming you. You're posting too much. <laughs> I said, so let's do some math here. So you have a million and a half followers. You posted four times. Ten people complained. So ten people out of a million and a half complained. Like what's wrong with you? You're yeah. like, you know, like so you you would rather not risk losing ten people. Mm -hmm versus making sales for the other one point, you know, four nine million who mm -hmm. might buy. Like, are you are you an idiot? I mean, okay, so maybe people complain, but that represents a hundred pissed off people. Mm -hmm. But so what? So I mean if you piss off a hundred people but you reach one point four eight million people or whatever, mm -hmm. that's a trade off I would make all day long. I mean, yeah. you know, what's wrong with your brain? And you know what? The people that are complaining, they're not going to buy anyway. If, if, it, if it's that easy for them to complain, let them yeah. complain. People email me, you know, a complaint about, you know, oh, your service is not worth it. I'm like, okay. Like, I don't care. Like, do whatever you want. I mean, it doesn't matter because there's too many people that love it for well, me that, to actually care about this one small instance that does not represent reality. People's complaints tell me more about them than about me. Exactly. I, I invented an uh, acronym which is UCM, UCM, 
right? Okay. So now when people complain to me on Google Plus, I say, well, just Occam. And everyone's like, what the hell does Occam stand for? They think it's, you know, a abbreviation of F-U-C-K-M, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> but it really stands for uncircle me. So I just say, you know, you don't like it, Occam. Uh -huh. I'll come if you can't take a joke. You know, what do I care? Yeah. And, and they just, they, they, I don't know, they just can't relate to someone telling them off. I mean, it's, it's like, to me, the analogy I use is, if you turn your TV on QVC, okay? Mm -hmm. Turn your TV on QVC, and they advertise the tourmaline bracelet, then the sterling silver bracelet, then the, you know, the, the massage thing, and then the next thing is uh, some special flashlight, and then the next thing is some special jump rope, and then the next thing is some special window cleaner, right? And then you say, man, I am so sick of advertising. You know, how dare QVC advertise this to me all the time? <laughs> In fact, the tourmaline bracelet was repeated twice. I saw it twice. I watched for eight hours, and I saw the same ad two times. How dare you advertise to me? What the hell's the matter with you? Change the freaking channel. You put it on QVC. You don't like QVC? Go to NBC. What do you want? Absolutely. That's great advice right there. I love that. <laughs> All right, now we have to talk about distribution because I know you got to go in a few minutes here. Yeah. Um, you got great advice on this. You tell us to separate distribution from virality. And I don't think a lot of companies make that distinction and it causes them to not make some key decisions. What's the difference? What's distribution? What's virality? Well, I mean, to me, you know, I, you're talking to a guy who believes in broad distribution. Mm -hmm. That's well, good. I mean, I believe yeah, in both. I, you know, who are me? Who am I to decide that you, know, you should buy it for one specific way? I mean, if you want to buy it online, God bless you. You want to buy a catalog, God bless you. You want to come to a store, God bless you. You want to go to Kmart, God bless you. You want to buy Best Buy, I don't care as long as you freaking buy it. Mm -hmm. So now I understand there's certain exclusivities and all that, but man, I think again, it's. I have to think it's either stupidity or arrogance. Now, you know, I suppose if you're Rolex and you're Porsche, you can get away with this. But you know, how many of your listeners are Rolex or Porsche? None. <laughs> None. So you know, let's let's cross this bridge when we come to it. That, you know, I, I would like to have a problem once in my life where, for example, my book. My book is over distributed. It's in too many stores. <laughs> right. The people don't feel exclusive because everywhere they go, they see my book. They go to the airport, they see my book, right? They go to they go to uh, Walgreens, they see my book. They go to Kmart, they see my book. They go to Costco, they see my book. This is a high quality problem. I I, <laughs> I pray for the day that I have this problem. Mm -hmm. And so distribution is really getting your product or service in the channel, in front of people, in all these different ways. Virality is really getting the product to kind of spread itself and make it yeah. one of those sort of you know inbuilt things. But we need both. We need distribution oh, channels yeah. and we need virality. And you're saying just plaster it everywhere. <laughs> if you if you lack distribution, I don't see how virality can happen. <laughs> mm. you, need, right? you need distribution to seed virality, don't you? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's and, a good and point. Of course, the flip side is also true. You need virality, meaning a good product. Otherwise, why would the distributors carry it? Because right? they're not going to sell it and they're not going to make money and they're not going to care. <laughs> you need both. Well, duh. Yeah, no, that's great. And then the next thing kind of is it falls in line with that to allocate responsibility. When you know you need both, now you can allocate responsibility, right? Hey, you, your job is distribution. Get us deals. Get us in front of people. Hey, your job, engineers, product people, you are on virality. Make that happen. Yes. And they're both yes. spreading the product, right? Yes, absolutely. No, that's absolutely. great. Um, now, when it comes to distribution deals, partnerships, obviously, you know, Apple has those. They're in Best Buy and those kind of things. But right. there's a lot of partnerships that startups can have, whether it's software as a service, whether it's some digital good they're selling. I mean, whatever they're doing, there's partnership opportunities for distribution. Um, and one of the things you say is obey the law of big numbers. Um, this is a big one. What is the law of big numbers? Well, the law of big numbers is you got to get it out there, right? You have to take a lot of shots to figure it out. Mm -hmm. I'm going to right now. Um, <laughs> Bless you. Oh, you Bless can edit you. this. Oh, oh, hell, man. Um, <laughs> you all right? Just talk about distribution. You make me get all up. Um, <laughs> so the law of big numbers is you, you need to take a lot of shots. You need a lot of experiments. You need, you need to try a lot of distribution. Um, yeah. And distribution with channels that are big, they have a lot of numbers, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It takes a while. Um, you know, I'm advising Motorola right now, and God, I learned how hard it is to get phones into the channel. 
Um, you know, in some South American countries, it takes weeks to flow through the channel. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it, you know, not everything is Amazon one click yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> <Let me say. laughs> you need big numbers for the end of the funnel to make sense. Yeah, it really does. No, yeah. that's great. Um, the next thing is you say look for adjacency when you're looking for these distribution partners. Um, the example you give in the book is like eBay and PayPal. They're adjacent that's industries. Um, that's important, is it? Because you can really ride on the coattails of companies that are almost like you, need what you're doing, but different, right? And where, where your products complement each other. And yeah. PayPal, eBay is you know maybe the Classic. best example of that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, can't get much better than that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I hope you don't ask me for another example in real that's time. That's fine. There's two, three more in the book, but I can't remember them either. <laughs> no, that's fine. But that's the way I started past the think, right, is, you know, if I'm PayPal, who's my eBay? If I'm eBay, who's my PayPal? Right, right. now, everyone listening to this, they have an eBay. They just don't know who it is yet because, again, they're not seeing the gorilla. They're not seeing what's adjacent and what's possible, and they have to really open up their minds, like, who can you do business with to open up whole new channels of big numbers to really get your product out there? Um, well, you also say, oh, go ahead. I'll give you an example. So with my book, Ape, so Ape stands for author, publisher, entrepreneur, and it teaches people how to write a book. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what is a company that really wants people to write more books and in particular to self-publish them? Okay, so let's think. Which company would really love everybody to write a book and self-publish? Amazon. Mm -hmm. Right? Amazon would much rather you write a book, self-publish through Kindle, then to write a book and maybe get it published by some New York publisher. Mm -hmm. So Amazon is eBay and I'm trying to be PayPal. I'm uh -huh. trying to help, help Amazon get more books by getting more people to self-publish. So I'm trying to work with Amazon to get the book out. Mm -hmm. And it's good for Amazon because the more people who read my book, more self-published books, the better it is for them, right? Yeah. It's good for me because I sell books. Yeah. So I think that's an example of adjacency. Yeah, and sometimes you have to educate the adjacent markets about what you bring to the table. You have to and go to Amazon and say, look, here's what I can do. <laughs> not sometimes, every time. Yeah, every time, right? Because they're also not seeing the gorilla the opposite way. <laughs> well, but you know, the problem is that um, every entrepreneur comes to their eBay saying this is what I can do for you right so they, whether it's an Amazon or an eBay or whatever it is they're probably getting 50 to 100 of these per day right <laughs> nobody comes up and says I'm a piece of crap company who can't do jack for you because <laughs> if everybody said that you'd be different uh -huh. but everybody says you know I can do this for you Amazon I can do this for you eBay I can do this for you Apple when I was at Apple every day people would come up and say you know there are 10,000 shrimp farmers so you should pay me to do shrimp farming software for Macintosh. And I'm like, you know, 10,000 shrimp farmers, that's not our market. He goes, no, 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 no. You, we, I could drive you into that market. Like, uh -huh. And the next phone call is, you know, avocado farming. And the, yeah, and the next one is dental, legal, medical, chiropractic, orthopedic mm -hmm. surgeon. You know, everybody wants to do your favor. It's very hard to separate who truly is a PayPal and who is just trying to blow smoke up your butt? So. Yeah, no, that's very true. Um, and then the last thing we'll talk about with distribution, yeah. which might be the most important one, is focus on revenue, right? People focus on other things, don't they? They focus on, you know, like you said, hey, I got tweeted, but they had this many followers. Here's my reach. They're not yeah. really focused on how much money did I make. <laughs> well, you know, at the end of the day, you either made a sale or you did it. Yeah. Um, and it is that true. Uh, now, obviously, there are long-term sales. There are, you know, there are ways to get into the market, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But, you know, at some level, uh, I tell this to startups all the time. At some level, sales fixes everything, man. As long mm -hmm. as you're selling, you're in the game. Yeah. And a lot of people they don't like to hear that, you know. They, they, but I, in terms of keeping your investors happy, your employees happy, your everything happy, man, it's all about sales. Yeah. No startup has ever went out of business because their vanity metrics weren't high enough. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's money. Um, all right, we don't have time to dig into this, but you have a great section on do-it-yourself PR. In a nutshell, in a couple sentences, what does a startup need to do to do PR instead of hiring an agency? Well, the simple answer to that, it's, it's almost like, seems like insultingly simple is, mm -hmm. You know, the key to great PR is to have a great product. <laughs> I mean, uh -huh. You know, because I'll tell you something, it's, 
I've evangelized good stuff and I've evangelized crap, and it is a lot easier to evangelize good stuff. So 90% of PR is having a good stuff. So this means either align yourself with good stuff or create good stuff. But the concept that you know a PR professional can successfully market crap is false. I mean, obviously it has happened in history, but it's the harder way. Yeah. So um, this is called Guy's Golden Touch, which is not whatever I touch turns to gold. I wish that was true. Guy's Golden Touch is whatever is gold guy touches. <laughs> so that's the key. That's good. That's I like the that. Key. Yeah, 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 that's great. All right, last question, guys. This has been an incredible interview. You just asked question four times already, man. Well, this really is the last one. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> All right, what's the best advice you have for any startup that's listening? Uh, probably the best start, best advice. That's, they're trying well, to grow. What's the best growth to, advice? They're trying to grow. I would say get your ass on social media. That that. You know, it's not a fad anymore. It's not an experiment. It's going to happen. Get on it. it. You know, get over it. Figure out how to use it. You know, if you're a restaurant, figure out how to get sixty thousand followers, and you can tell them. You know, we have Thursday night special, whatever. Mm -hmm. And the way you get more followers is you provide value, not just not just advertising and promoting your crap, but you know, telling people. If you're, for example, continue with the restaurant. Mm -hmm. So if you're a restaurant and you have social media presence, don't just talk about your specials. Talk about, oh, did you see the National Geographic special about how People catch tuna or something. Now I probably just offended all the tuna lovers in America, and they're gonna like you know write into you say how they dare you. Yeah, you yeah, know <laughs> since slaughter of kind fish, right? But whatever, right? And so you know, let's say there's an article about how to brew coffee or how to clean your coffee maker or I don't know what you know the proper way to cut a tomato with the special knife, right? So the restaurant social media should tweet that stuff out. It has nothing to do with the restaurant except that. It adds value. People are going to reshare that. You're going to get more followers. So think of yourself like NPR. NPR puts out great content all year long, and every once in a while you run a telethon. Mm -hmm. That's how you should be thinking. Content all the time. You earn the right to run a telethon. Yeah, that's that's the great. All right, what do you want to pitch? You're giving away your eight book. How can we get it? Is that what you want to promote right, right now? Uh, wait, let me get one for you to show it to you. All right, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, so this is Ape the Book. All right. It stands for Author, Publisher, Entrepreneur. It explains how to write a book, publish the book, and then sell the book. Even if you're not writing a book, the E part of Ape Entrepreneur is just a great guide to using social media to sell anything. Mm -hmm. And so right now, um, it's just about the first anniversary, and so we're giving this book away, uh, Kindle format. And all people have to do uh, is to go to apethebook.com slash anniversary. All right. You get a code that you can enter into Amazon to get it free. Uh, if you're not in the U.S., send an email to ape.the.book at gmail.com, and we'll get it to you another way. But if you're in the U.S., just go to apethebook.com slash anniversary. Yeah, and I listened to the audio version of that book because you have it on Audible also. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is an incredible book. If you are trying to write a book, self-publish, it would be foolish to do it without first reading that. I mean, it would be absolutely foolish. <laughs> so, Guy, thank you so much again for coming on Growth Actor TV. Thank you. Good luck to you.